Hey, this is Mr. Spencer. We're talking about how to explore power and agency in our AP Times writings. You do have a couple questions you can go through, the last of which is about what is a possible question that you're going to craft and write for our upcoming Socratic seminar on power. All right, so follow along with me here on the slides or in class there. Go at your own speed. Here's what I've come up with to help you out. All right. Power. It's a motif that exists in all texts. What's a text? Well, a text is anything that has information in it. We're in AP Lit, so we're studying literature. But you can apply this to anything in the world, whether it's a novel, a poem, a painting, current events in the news, a boyfriend or girlfriend who gives you information, you have to evaluate. We're, we're, we're trying to look at why power here. So all information is influenced by movements of power. Plus, your own life is dictated by power, or lack thereof. How much freedom do others allow you to have? We wrote about this on a bell ringer January 19th. Check it out. The more you train yourself to look for power struggles or the influences of power in your own analysis work or English or social studies class or anywhere, the more sophisticated and complex your interpretations and interactions will be. And it might be even more meaningful. Your life could have more meaning. As we study our choice novels and the poetry this month in February, we will continue to remind ourselves to examine the underlying forces of power, agency, control, marginalization at work. What are politics? Well, politics are ideas shared in the news and conversations, but some students often resist engaging in political conversation because social issues are too controversial or they assume it's not interesting. Boring. I know when I was 16, 17 years old, I really didn't want to spend much time thinking about politics. What are politics? Well, it's essentially the system of how power is exerted or how people seek power. Politics equal power. Anytime you hear someone talking about politics or using the term politics, they're talking about power and how it's organized, managed, the system of power that we are all inside of, whether you like it or not. Anytime you discuss or analyze this, you're engaged in a political discourse. Politics is not just about the president or senators or Congress, but it's about how all of us confront the limitations of our power. If we're stuck here inside our skull. We have two eyes and our, our senses process all the information around us, but we're limited. And there's very few people in this country that have power. Are you one of them? You can see the root of the word politics, for instance, in other words like police or policies. Okay, think about this. So, essential questions for our unit right now. Who has power? Where does power come from? What cost is associated with power? How do those in power marginalize those without Power is manifested most obviously through physical force, okay? World history, the story of mankind, physical force, often violence, or power being manifested through the threat of physical force. People demonstrate power through violence, and this is seen most clearly in history through wars and military battles. I mean, you look at world history, you look at your U.S. history class, it's organized around wars which are just a word we use to describe absolute violence. And that's a reality. So what else about power? Well, other visible forms of power in our life involve authorities, government agencies that enforce control through either violence or the threat of violence or bondage, locking you up, taking you to prison, jail, house arrest, juvenile detention centers. You get the idea. In your personal life, power is likely enforced most directly by your parents, the police, yes, even your teachers enforcing power. In your own personal life, there might even be other people close to you that enforce power, such as your boyfriends, your girlfriends. For me, it's my dogs controlling my life. People like group leaders, even bullies or those that harass you or friends of yours. Do you have siblings or so-called friends that try to control you? 
And more broadly, how is power manifested in government? Authorities and government agencies that most clearly demonstrate power in our modern world include the police, the courts, the state governments, the federal government nationally. Looking at how the United States federal government power is represented through Congress, the Senate, the House of Representatives, and agencies such as the FBI, the NSA, the CIA, the Department of Homeland Security, the Office of the Presidency, extrapolating the United States power structures across the world are the branches of the military. Okay, we have an Office of Foreign Affairs. And since the U.S. is the most powerful military in the history of planet Earth, by all accounts, including we've got the Army, the Navy, the Coast Guard, the Marines, etc. Is your life directly influenced by any of these larger branches? It probably is more than you realized. Directly, indirectly. As you turn 18, you'll start to see this manifest more and more. And because power structures are often abstract and they're what collections of ideas that people then enforce through violence or threats of violence, most power structures are invisible. The average person is, however, distracted by the iconography, the symbols, the concrete examples of power. Okay, we see them in the news, social media, police officers, buildings in Washington, D.C., the White House, for example, concrete examples of power structures. In real power, though, it is concentrated through abstract and invisible structures that prop up and support the institutions of government and corporations that control most of our lives, like the schools, the banks, the hospitals, the courts. Are you with me? Follow along. How do we apply this to literature? Life itself? A good student like you learns to identify the symptoms and byproducts of these power structures. Okay, There's violence, there's harassment, explicit or threatening language, or simply expectations being written down and posted somewhere. Invisible power structures showing up on its learning. Invisible power structures showing up on signs, billboards, posters, flyers, advertisements, social media. You see these every day. You are processing hundreds of pieces of these informational power structures. You don't even realize it. But it's a part of your life. You get so used to it, you filter most of it out. Okay? So let's see what we can do with this now. How can you explore subtext, whether in life, or in literature, an AP Lit student should attempt to properly hunt and search for examples of these invisible power structures, like hunting for invisible yet significant literary devices, such as irony or tone, your good friends there. The motif of power in all its forms is applicable to literally any text, a story, a poem, whatever. A poem might have only 25 words in it, for example, but those words are shaped, influenced, and limited by the invisible power structures that hide in the subtext. Okay, you're not just studying poetry. Okay, when we're looking at language and literature, you're finding out how people make meaning out of information. How do you make meaning in your life? Is your life meaningful? That's what the study of literature is. So look at a word like genocide. It's only eight letters long genocide. Yeah, it carries the weight of incredible power structures. And the connotation of a word like genocide fills up whole books, incredibly long Wikipedia articles. And this idea, the connotation of genocide, it can be used to convey incredibly complex political ideas and behaviors. Okay, One word is propped up and supported by incredible power structures. Okay, Consider other words like freedom, or words like ballet, or words like education. What invisible power structures support those? Ask yourself, what invisible power structures influenced the Salem witch trials in the crucible, or the tendency to judge or romanticize the past in the great Gatsby? In my younger and more vulnerable years, my father gave me some advice that I've been pondering. Okay. Invisible forces like prejudice, marginalization, agency, sexism, racism, ageism, capitalism, psychological power structures like cognitive bias or conformity are common invisible motifs that you can use to explore subtext. And some of you are taking psychology classes right now. Think about how conformity and psychological constructs interact with these invisible power structures. All right. Where is the invisible? How do we find it? 
other abstract ideas such as laws and the concept of justice are offshoots of this power hierarchy. How do laws, though invisible, limit our behavior? How does the concept of justice, even if it's entirely fictional or made up, is there real justice in life? How does this concept of justice influence our expectations of the world, either through your conversations, your friends, social media, in a courtroom? And as you read your independent reading choice novel, have you considered what invisible power structures influence the characters or behaviors of people or the governments in your novel? Okay, Some of those books like Parable of the Sower or Station Eleven or even Beloved have governments that seem to be disintegrating, whether it's around a post-apocalyptic event or the civil war in Beloved. Invisible forces like prejudice, marginalization, agency, sexism, racism, ageism, capitalism, psychological power structures like cognitive bioconformity, these are invisible motifs that you can use to explore the subtext. What about the power structure between Jane and Rochester? Or uh, those noises coming from the attic? Or in Everything I Never Told You, or Their Eyes Are Watching God, what invisible power structures influence the behaviors of someone like Lydia Lee? or the behaviors of someone like James in the affair, or somebody like the main character of Their Eyes Are Watching God, Janie. What influences their behavior? Okay, look for those. They're invisible. You have to be trained to see them. So that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to train you. All right. The text is up here. These are all the things we can see on the surface level. This is surface level. Okay, you're good at seeing this. It's easy to see lots of these things. The behaviors, the rituals, the artifacts, the physical environment. We see those when we read a text, a poem, a novel, or just in our own world. Okay, read the world like it's a text. This is the stuff down here, the subtext. That's the stuff that's harder. And that's what an AP Lit student trains themselves to see. We look for tone, we look for irony, and we look for these invisible culture elements. Okay, the perceptions, the embedded thoughts, the cultural values. Okay, the author doesn't write about them, and the people in your life don't talk about them explicitly, but they're there all the time, like ghosts, like UFOs. They're flying around. You just have to be trained to see them. Can you identify the invisible power structures at play here? This is a painting called The Last Supper. It's one of the most famous events in Western culture, and Leonardo da Vinci painted this, this restoration painting here. What power structures are at play? Judas, Jesus, Christianity, Roman governments. Can you identify the invisible power structures at play here? This is the flag of France, freedom. This is liberty leading the people, a famous painting representing the French Revolution the proletariat, the bourgeoisie. Can you identify the invisible power structures at play here? You remember this painting? Oh, it's beautiful. What power structures are at play? The natural, the artificial, what cut down that tree trunk? Was it a man-made axe, artificial? What about the natural world over here? What about the sun? What about planet Venus right there? What power structures influence the elements of a text like this? I could talk for 10, 15, 20 minutes about this. I could talk for 10, 15, 20 days about this. But we're training ourselves to look for these invisible power structures in life, in literature. So a good fancy concept to look at is agency. This is a college term, okay? A lot of people in college use this in their academic writing, but you're an AP Lit. We're trying to get that college credit, so take a look at it here. Agency, it's that precise, sophisticated term that describes the capacity to act or exert power. Okay, powerful people have agency. Powerless people, they lack agency. Agency is useful as an analytical term because it helps you identify and interpret how a person or a character or a group of people can gain agency throughout a text, incrementally, piece by piece, gaining agency. Okay, resisting or confronting the invisible power structures that control and limit them. Okay, she gained agency through sheer willpower, or somebody might lack agency because they are too young to vote. Okay. Is that you? Are you going to vote? You got to be 18 years old in this country. So, how does one gain agency? 
How many stories, books, movies, TV shows feature a character with no agency, a zilch, at the beginning, who gains ultimate agency and the power to exert themselves by the end of the story? Power struggles are an incredibly common storytelling device. You might know there's very common conflicts in literature that are just like, okay, man versus man, man versus nature, man versus God, man versus himself, man versus fate, man versus technology. Do you see some of these play out here? How do you confront those invisible power structures that limit or control your agency. It's easy to imagine a protagonist, the hero who lacks agency but wants something, and an antagonist like the villain who keeps it from them. This is in religious text, stories about characters like Icarus or Jesus or Siddhartha. And in most AP lit poems and novels, this archetype or pattern is usually twisted in a slightly more sophisticated manner more sophisticated than Stan Lee from Marvel, J.K. Rowling, James Cameron, Avatar, more sophisticated than Alan Moore, who wrote some of the Dark Knight Batman stories. Okay, so one of the questions on your assignment is, can you just think of a movie, TV show, or a book that features this kind of archetype or this pattern? Other literary devices you can connect being aware of these power struggles will allow you to better identify and analyze how an author or a poet exploits the reader's expectations. The most common reason that an author or a poet would want to subvert expectations is to create detachment. Irony. Creating that ironic detachment, that gap between the audience's expectations and what the author gives them, that's irony. It's beautiful. It's juicy. There's so much to analyze there. Look for it. Hunt for it. you got to train yourself to see it. An author also explores power struggles because power influences nearly all universal themes. If power is political, which it is, then consider how any story with a power struggle could also be considered a political allegory. What's an allegory? It's a type of story that basically tells one story on the surface but there's a deeper story being told through the subtext. The most popular examples of that is through The Wizard of Oz, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, Animal Farm, even The Scarlet Letter. These are examples of books that tell one story on the surface, but a political subtext is sort of underneath the surface level story. Okay, it's a piece of literature where characters, images, and or events act as symbols. It adds hidden meaning to the text. It uses symbolism, but it's broader and more general than just symbols. Okay, allegories have hidden meaning, which relates to morality, the fight for right and wrong, or politics, the struggle for power. Okay, so how does this help me on a timed writing? At the end of our independent reading choice unit, you will be asked to complete a timed writing essay over a passage from your choice novel, similar to your summer reading timed writing we did back in August from your summer reading choice. I give you a passage. You got 40 minutes to write a good essay. Okay, you will also have a timed writing essay over a poem next quarter after spring break. And it's a poem you've never read before. You got 40 minutes to read it and write an essay, a cold reading. So remember, on the AP exam in May, that's the test to get that college credit here. You got to write three essays in two hours. So we're practicing this timed pressure. It's okay. We get better at it. It's a muscle and we develop it. Okay, so how are you going to fit into this? This is what it would look like. For example, this is a 2018 poetry prompt. Okay, you get a few ideas like, what's the complex relationship between the speaker, the implied audience, and plant life? Okay, this was the poem Plants by Olive Senior. And they suggest a few literary techniques like syntax, diction, figurative language. What else can you look for? Well, certainly tone. How does an author convey meaning through tone? Irony. And what are we talking about now? Hello, power, agency, political subtext, what power struggles are occurring, what power struggles have influenced the surface level meaning of this text, how does it operate on a subtext or subconscious level, it's interesting stuff.
Are you interested in it? I'm pretty interested in it. So your practice timed writing essays will be graded on that AP six point rubric where you can earn one point for your original thesis, up to four points for quality of evidence, and one point for your level of sophistication. All right, that's the AP rubric. Ask yourself, what invisible power structures can you train yourself to identify and look for in a passage or poem that you're tested over? Okay, a reminder, you've got marginalization, prejudice, sexism, ageism, cognitive bias, conformity. Look for some of these in every poem, play, or story that you read. My suggestion is to think of power as a binary, okay? The haves and the have-nots, okay? In computer language, binary is ones and zeros. The light switch is on or the light switch is off. You have it or you don't. Who has power? Who doesn't? But they want it. The use of binary opposition in literature is a system that authors use to explore differences between groups of individuals, the cultural, the class, or gender differences. And authors may explore the gray area, that interesting area between these opposing forces, and see what can result from those perceived differences. Okay, so this is another college term, binaries, that you can use in your analysis. Okay, organize your analysis of power around, like, you could do this on perusal for the poem bank. You could do this for your choice novel or these upcoming timed writings. Think, what are the parameters of the power struggle? Where are the boundaries, the parameters? Where do you draw the line around it? Who are the victims of the power struggle? The ones that get marginalized. How is agency gained or lost in this struggle? what power struggle or what power structures ultimately are dismantled or strengthened in the end this type of framework can be applied to any text okay but we're training ourselves to get used to looking for this because it's invisible you can't see me so you got to look very carefully and train yourself to hunt for this in the subtext Another strategy that you might try when analyzing a text is to mentally pit two characters or elements against each other to see who has more agency. You know, choose two characters like Abigail Williams and Mary Warren from The Crucible. Mentally contrast them against each other. Okay, in this exercise, although the two characters may appear generally, they're both teenage girls in Salem, Massachusetts in 1692, they might seem to have similar power or social status, you can quickly determine what sets one apart from the other. For instance, one of them works for John Proctor, one of them used to work for John Proctor. One of them has influence over John, and it's not Mary anymore. One of them does not have influence over John. So when you sort of do this mental exercise, you'll see, all right, these, do these characters have similar power? Yes, but one is stronger than the other. Someone like Abigail clearly possesses more agency because she is more cunning and manipulative than Mary. For better or worse, that's the truth. And them's the breaks, okay? So how else could you look at this? Binary oppositions, a technique where an author positions two ideas in opposition to each other exploring those differences. This is also sometimes considered a juxtaposition, okay? Batman, the Joker, okay? One is serious, one is absurd. Kylo Ren and Rey from the new Star Wars trilogy. I loved it. Don't care what anyone else says. The Last Jedi was excellent. The Rise of the Skywalker was amazing, okay? So another useful strategy, binary oppositions, Here's an example from one of the most popular series ever, J.K. Rowling's Harry Potter. Think binaries. There's two major groups, the magical community and the non-magical community, okay? The yin and the yang. Harry and Voldemort, though, are binary opposites within the magical community. One is good, one is evil. Very simple, right? But Harry's quest is not just to liberate the magical community, but also he wants to liberate the non-magical muggles. His quest for power is thus noble, the quest for power and agency plays out on both the literal surface level in the narrative, but also on a more abstract philosophical level. And you don't really get that until the third and fourth book. 
Okay, so when you've reached the Goblet of Fire and you see the Prisoner of Azkaban, you see J.K. Rowling is operating on this subtextual level. And the books become much more mature because the themes and the political allegories underneath are much more complex. Okay, so a theme idea would be J.K. Rowling shows the dangers of creating such categorizations within society. You got to be careful when you create this social hierarchy because it can be very dangerous. So that's one example. Next week, you will have a Socratic seminar concerning the subject of power and agency. Google Meet video and Parlay will be included. Hybrid bridge students, they can go on live as well, or asynchronously, they can get on Parlay, but I'm gonna to try to do it live during class. At the time of me filming this video, we don't know whether or not we're on hybrid. So we'll see how many people are in the classroom live, but we'll make it work somehow, some way. Write two general discussion questions that can be focused on what social, historical, or cultural power struggles in your real life, current events in the news, or literary connections to your choice novel or the poem bank. Maybe you want to bring up anyone lived in a pretty how town. Maybe you got a question about the groundhog or Jericho Brown's The Tradition the Emperor of Ice Cream, or any of the other poems we're looking at. No, not everyone in class is reading your choice novel, okay? So keep the questions more general. You can include an idea from Station Eleven or Jane Eyre or Parable of the Sower or Beloved, but if you're trying to include an idea from everything I never told you or their eyes are watching God, just try to broadly direct the question into more general subjects that the whole class can try to answer. You could also consider posing a question related to the power struggles between the younger and the older generations, which we did in our analysis of anyone lived in a pretty how town. As you write your two general discussion questions, consider applying questions to any of the summer reading choice novels or The Crucible or The Great Gatsby. For instance, the power conflicts, the American dream. Is the American dream still alive? Do individuals still have equal power? to achieve their dreams in 2021? How do you see that power conflict? And remember, on the AP Lit exam, the last essay you write in the two hours is an open-ended prompt where you get to choose the book that you write about. So they might ask about something like, what's a character in a book that struggled with marginalization and did not have power or agency in their life? Okay, You could choose any of your summer reading books, your choice novel right now in February, or The Crucible, or Gatsby, or our next play, Hamlet, or Slaughterhouse-Five, the postmodern novel we'll read in April. But you've got to come up with your own essay for that. Okay, we'll do some practice until the AP exam in May, and we've got a Socratic seminar next week, the week of February 15th through the 19th. What questions have you written down? Come prepared. Here's some others you might consider. Who has power? Where does it come from? What cost is associated with it? How do those in power marginalize those without it? What causes shifts in power? Are internal or external forces more impactful on those shifts? Does power necessitate the loss of another's power? If somebody gains power, does someone else lose it? What is the price of ambition? How are we governed by fate or free will and or power? How is power justified? How can power both corrupt and cure us? What makes power so attractive to people? What moral responsibilities come with receiving power? How is it created? How does this creation of power generate positive and negative outcomes? What traits or steps could manipulate that? How does power change us? What kind of responsibility do we have if we have power? What is power? What is required circumstantially for a person to have it? Can a person with absolute power not be corrupted? And what can we do to those in power when they abuse their privilege? Which is manifested first, power or the hunger for power? What does one individual have the power to affect change? How do they do that? What is a responsible reaction to the feeling of powerlessness? This is Mr. Spencer signing off.